Hey, everyone. It's your host, Daisha. So you're about to hear my conversation with Dr. George E. Lewis, who is a very cool guy, and uh, he is going to blow your minds and explode any previous definitions of what classical music is that you may have had and what classical music can do. Among many things, Dr. Lewis is the chair of composition at Columbia University. He's generally a big deal in the classical music world, but despite all of the accolades that he has and all the zillions of awards that he's won. He couldn't have been a more fun guy and have put on fewer airs. I had a really great time talking to him, and I think you're going to have a great time listening to him. By the way, before we get to the show, I have to get a shout out to all of the Classical Classroom alumni who were at the Grammys either winning or being nominated or, you know, just hanging out. Um, We have to give some love to Matt Heimovitz, whose producer David Frost won, Jonathan Biss, Thomas Hampson, Sonia Yoncheva, all you people, you go. Also, if you subscribe to Rate us and review us on iTunes. That makes you a winner and that much closer to Kevin Bacon. All right, enjoy the show. There's a rumor going around that classical music can be hoity-toity. But here in the classical classroom, we beg to differ. Beethoven 5. (laughs) (laughs) Isaiah is shaking with excitement Oh, I mean, there's just so many great parts of the opera. He asked me to play his favorite spot in the first moon of the Brahms. And then he said, I started using those licks in my guitar solos. How to be classical music rock stars, because there's not enough of that in this business. Occasionally, I would plug in the mandolin to my distortion pedals. (laughs) I don't change my voice. And talking to classical music voice. (laughs) I'm playing classical music now. I mean, it's, it's the same 12 notes. That's what's so cool about it. I'm Daisha Clay, a classical music newbie, and I'm trying to learn all I can about the music. Come learn with me and the classical music experts I invite into the Classical Classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me today is Dr. George E. Lewis. He's a composer, among many other things, and he's currently the Edward H. Case professor of American music at Columbia University. If you know of a major award or fellowship for music, he's probably won it, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Guggenheim, MacArthur, National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, His work has been presented by ensembles big and small from the London Philharmonic to the ensemble Eric Satie. He's currently in the midst of a composer's residency at Rice University's Shepherd School of Music. Dr. Lewis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Deja. Thank you very much. So, okay, first, you're going to introduce me to a piece of yours, because it's very different than a lot of the work that we have talked about on this show, and you're going to walk me through this piece. Why don't you give the piece a little bit of an introduction, tell me what it's called, and basically what it's about. Okay, the piece is called Anthem, Mm -hmm. and it was written for the Wet Ink Ensemble, which is a a very important group of young classical contemporary musicians living in New York. And and their plan was they wanted to tour as kind of like the Wet Ink Band. Uh And that's why we said, well, you got to have a band song. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to write a piece that would they could use as an anthem. In other words, something would represent them, that they could play and say, this is us, this is who we are. Yeah, you're the best band in the land, so take this with you <laughs> and play it. That's great. <laughs> so it's a functional aspect of art, and uh, there's a sort of a rah-rah aspect about it. Uh-huh. And it's written for, um, I, I mean, flute, saxophone, Oh boy, I'm trying to think of the instrumentation now. Violin um, and electronics, piano. I think those are the basic instruments. So basically, I had to work with uh, a singer, the soprano as a part of the ensemble. And the soprano, their soprano is Kate Soper, who's also a composer. And as as it happens, a graduate of the Rice uh, Shepherd School of Music. And uh, she's a fantastic singer and composer. And she writes operas now. She's doing all kinds of amazing things. So you, you always wonder, when, what are people going to sing? Where is that going to come from? And so I decided to write this, the libretto or whatever it is. I wanted to write it myself. And so, but I, you know, I'm not really a writer like that. I'm kind of an academic prose writer, I, musicologist, that sort of thing. So, so I took phrases that I had made 
and subjected them to a kind of an algorithmic treatment based on a text from 1947 by a Catholic nun who was a literary theorist, uh, Sister Miriam Joseph, and she wrote a book called Shakespeare's Use of the Arts of Rhetoric, because it turns out that uh, Elizabethan school children in, were expected to memorize at least 200 forms of rhetorical speech discourses, you know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, we some of if you went to acad- if you went to school in the last twenty years, you know some of them. You know, synecdoche, for example, or uh, some of the others. So there's about two hundred of these, and they're not really they're forms that you can use to basically improvise, and they go back to the first century at the time of Quintilian, mm-hmm. who wrote a twelve volume Institutio Oratoria on how to speak extemporaneously. That is, in other words, how to give an improvised speech in front of a a government official, things that Mm -hmm. people in our government don't really know how to do. But but all their speeches are on teleprompters. But back then in the Roman Senate, you really had to to speak and Mm -hmm. there was no teleprompter. So that's how you learn to do it. So I found myself making loops of different kinds. Like she would suddenly say, oh man, we got to be your band. We want to be your band. We're the best band in the land. You know, the <laughs> best band. We're the best band. Are we the best band? We, you know we're the best band. You know it. You know it. You know, it's, <laughs> and it, and it kind of goes on like that. And so but that sort of, it's a way of fragmenting simultaneously, fragmenting the text, but also kind of formalizing it and unifying mm-hmm. it. And and Kate is delivering the text with this very breathless, very intense, very ironic. It's There's a lot of acting in it, so she's very good at that. And there's just a lot of very intense, noisy stuff going on underneath her. Yeah. Well, let's hear some of it. I am intrigued now. So I'm curious, listening to this, like how much of this is improvised and how much of it is composed? Well, you know, a few years ago I decided that these people were so good at playing what you write that I didn't really need them to improvise. So it's all written there. They have really? To, yeah, yeah. But you're uh, known for improvisation. Like you've written books on it. So that's Yeah, we just finished our, our two-volume Oxford Handbook of Critical Improvisation Studies. But for us, improvisation was like not just music. It was like shifting cultivation of farming in Sierra Leone. Or it was, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> it was like things that are not in the moment, which take uh-huh. months to, but are no less improvised for that. So, so we were looking so sort f- of like long-term improv. Like usually exactly, when we think yeah. of, of improvisation, we're thinking about like improv musicians or, or, or uh, actors who are spontaneity is is a big part of it but you're talking about improvising on a long large macro scale long term lifelong and beyond strategies huh. these shifting cultivators they say the land belongs to them it belongs to their children it belongs to people yet unborn 
So that's the scope of the improvisation they're dealing with. So it, it really changes it when you think to think that improvisation is not just about music, but it's kind of a, a human condition and increasingly huh. a machine condition. Because we talked about machines doing improvisations. We talked about emergency management. Let's say 9-11. There are all these dissertations on 9-11 as an emergency improvisation management problem. Um, so there, are, they talked about negotiation in the business world. So, and a lot of these people, they're not thinking about improvisation in music. That's not their model. They have another vision of what improvisation is. So yeah, so this piece, there's any improvisation. So, in but it. then this piece that sounds very, very much like it's happening of a moment, very much like it's happening spontaneously. Well, that's is good. Written, you want that. <laughs> Yeah. So you've yeah. you've managed to capture that spirit of improvisation in writing. <laughs> well, even that very even that very hard part with the drums at the beginning is yeah. written out. So wow. So it's um so every, you know after a while the, it's amazing these amazing musicians they could do it you know. Hmm. Let's hear a little more. <laughs> He's hand dancing to the music. You know it. You know it. You gotta know it. You gotta know we wanna. This is that algorithmic thing I was telling you about. She's making up the permutations on the basic. Yeah. You know it. You know it. Yeah. You know. This reminds me of of uh, Berlioz. Really? Wow. Like I the thought, way she's she's talking. The I would thought Berio. Barrio, Barrio, thank you. Barrio, Barrio. There we go. That's yeah. the guy I was talking about. Yeah, well, you know, See Kathy you Barbarian. <laughs> it's more like the Kathy Barbarian of Stripsody, which was her own piece. Oh. More than, let's say, the sequ sequences. I would say was, this is a that kind of thing where Kathy Barbarian plays all these different roles, huh. and she she sort of channels all these different styles of music. And hmm. It's an incredible tour de force, you know, hmm. and also quite a feminist tour de force as well, yeah. you know. Like you? Do we like you? What are you using to make the electronic noises? Uh, there are a lot of samples. Um, some of them are samples of trombones doing odd things like burping. And <laughs> <laughs> some of them are synthesized sounds. Uh -huh. Some of them are samples from uh, environmental samples. Uh -huh. But they're all keyed to the score so that the electronic musician Sam Pluta is making them happen just at the right moment mm. in following the score. There's a couple of duck calls in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a this is a please, baby, please, baby, please. Please, baby, baby, please. Listen to that me. That comes directly from James Brown live at Augusta, Georgia, where he has this incredible sort of improvised thing that he does, where he says, "I got to, I got to, I got to, got to, I got to, I got to, I got to." <laughs> 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 Macy O! <laughs> you know, so a lot of that, there's that influence, the James Brown influence is in there too. So she's channeling that as well. We gotta be, we gotta be your band! Baby, baby, please! We gotta be your band! We know you know! How is this related to what people think of as more traditional classical music? Because as I'm listening to it, if I wasn't talking to a composer, I wouldn't immediate, immediately think, oh, well, this is a kind of classical music. So tell, tell me about that. The funny thing is that it has all the essential features of classical music as it's come from that kind of Western tradition, which mm -hmm. at certain point, the Western tradition settled on notation. 
so that what you were doing as a composer, you were engaged in a dialectic with notation. Now, before that, you had Beethoven, the great improviser, you had Bach, the great improviser, Mozart. Improvisation was kind of like the, the standard way that things got done. And so cadenzas weren't written out. You know, those got written out later. So, so but at a certain point around the middle of the 19th century, the, the ascendancy of notation as being the way in which pieces were transmitted through the generations mm -hmm. uh, sort of took hold. So that's what's happening here. But the other thing is that classical music has always been a site of change and contestation. Mm. And there's no reason why improvisation can't be a part of classical music. Mm. Now, one of the classics of contemporary classical music that I grew up with was Robert Ashley's The Wolfman. If you know the score, or as I'm, as I'm remembering the score, the score basically says you take a fifth of scotch and you drink as much of it as you can, and then you get out and you scream this text that Rob, Bob wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, if that's classical music, then you can do anything you want. And so that's, it's, and I think this is the thing about Beethoven or any of them was that people are expressing how they felt. They looked at their environment. They did what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that classical music is a zone where we have to feel restricted or we have to walk in and sort of mm -hmm. act in a certain way or there's a certain behavior complex is associated with it, you know, that's not going to be helpful going huh. forward for younger people who are looking for ways to find themselves in music. That's interesting. So you're kind of going back to the roots of classical music. You're kind of going way back to when it first began in a way. You kind of have to do that. You kind of have to, any music you're involved with, and the other side of it is that classical music has always been international. Yeah. And it's now it's more international than ever. Yeah. And so there's no reason why it can't participate in America's and the world's diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, diversity of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, all these areas. You've got all that going on. If you look at someone like Benjamin Britten, or if you look at someone like Florence Price, or if you mm -hmm. look at, there's just so many examples of that kind of thing. So yeah. whatever image we have of it, we need to revise it uh, in dialogue with the realities of what the form, what the tradition has produced, and how it's interacted with other traditions. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's classical music nowadays that sounds a lot like rock and roll, or sounds uh -huh. a lot like a certain kind of jazz, or sounds a lot like Turkish music, or it's, it's hard to know. It's beautifully put. Let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing at Rice. Uh, how long have you been there, and what have you been working on? Well, it's a short residency, but it took us a long time to prepare because the, they've got these incredible composers, first of all, composition students, amazing performers, and um, they're playing two of my pieces tomorrow night. I've gotten together with the performers. I mean, the performers are first rate. It's so it's yeah. been an extraordinary experience and a, and a nice new building, although it's raining a lot this week, but that's how it is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't know you were coming to the Pacific Northwest. Oh, uh, yeah, that's minus right. Minus the cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but you've been working on a piece for the Terrell Sky Space. Yes. And um, before we talk about that, I just want to tell listeners who don't know who Terrell is and what the Sky Space is. So James Terrell is an artist who works with uh, primarily light, space, and the natural landscape. And um, he's created this gorgeous installation on the Rice University campus called the Sky Space, which audiences can actually go and sit inside of and watch the sunset and the sunrise every day. And it's got this small area in the middle where musicians can set up to accompany the show sometimes. So that's that's what the sky space is. And so, so what are you doing with that space? The sky space is extraordinary because it has 16 discrete channels of sound inside the center. It's like when you go in, it's like going into an Egyptian tomb, but it's 
open at the top the way I think it's the um, the Colise- not the Colosseum. There's this big the Pantheon in Rome. It's like uh-huh. that with a big hole at the top. Yeah. So you can see the sky through it. So there are these incredible electronic sound possibilities. And then there are these lights, these two rows of LEDs on top. And so every day, apparently, at at sunrise and sunset, there are these sort of long form, hour and a half, very, very no drama like uh, light shows. It's Mm -hmm. like a light dance. Yeah. And there's no sound. But thanks to uh, Kurt Stallman at the uh, Electronic Music Studios there, they he's, he's have... He's been on this show before. An yeah. incredible composer and uh, electronic musician. And he has managed to find a way to incorporate sound into some of the performances. The students make pieces for the sky space. And so that's going to be my job. And what I'm trying to make, actually, is something that will interact with the surrounding environment. And we're Mm -hmm. still at the sort of infancy of what we're doing. We're thinking about interacting with the weather um, through things like uh, weather. It's a good thing. I saw the other side of Houston's weather because I was here most of 2015. I saw, but I didn't see any of this really wet stuff, you know, floods and all that. But um, what we're trying to do is we want to have like wind sensors. We want to be able to download what they call hyper local weather from the internet and have that influence the progress of the sounds and the images. And we want to be able to also reuse some of the material from the 2015 installation we made at the Contemporary Art Museum, Houston, the CAM, mm-hmm. which is called Whispering Bayou, which was a collaboration with the Houstonian multimedia artist and producer, uh, Carol Parrot Blue and and Jean Baptiste Barriere, another multimedia artist. So three mm-hmm. multimedia artists working on this piece. We developed a team of local people to interview close to maybe a hundred people, asking them questions about what life was like for them in Houston. And it turns out that like a hundred languages are spoken here. We managed to uh, get people representing 60 different language groups. That is so awesome. And so all of that was sort of spatialized in four channels. And we also had electronic imagery as well. So that when people came up to the screen, their images were transformed. And it was Mm -hmm. a it was it was all about uh, Carol Parrot Blue. It was an homage for her to Bray's Bayou as being a native Estonian. Uh-huh. It turns out there are like seven hundred thousand people living here, and it, she found out that one of every four Houstonians is from another country. So mm-hmm. that means this is super international diversity yeah. of the city, which was represented by that. And so we feel that that should be heard again, perhaps in a different context. So in some of the people we interviewed, if they come to the Terrell Sky Space in 2018, uh-huh. they'll probably hear themselves. That's super cool. Yeah, I, I actually uh, saw that that installation at the Contemporary Arts Museum, and it was oh, really you neat. Like you can, like you could, um, you actually sort of became a part of the the light show, and so it was really fun to to hang out in front of it and make goofy <laughs> shapes and stuff with your body. <laughs> and, uh, but it's but that is true. I mean, Houston is uh, that's one of my favorite things about it is is that you're never not meeting different kinds of people. It's I mean, uh, socioeconomic racial and cultural diversity it's it's kind of amazing and it's it's awesome that that you capitalized on that for your piece and i'm interested to see what you do with it in the sky space too and i and i love the idea that you're going to be working with the crazy weather as well good luck with that yeah well i come from <laughs> chicago it's not quite the same so. <laughs> Oh, Chicago. Okay. Well, that's a whole different story. It's so cold there. Yep. (laughs) Well, George Lewis, thank you so much for being on the Classical Classroom. This was really interesting. I wish we had time to keep talking. (laughs) Well, thanks, David. You'll have to come back. I'd love to. Thanks very much. (laughs) All right, everybody. That does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to HoustonPublicMedia.org slash Classroom. You can follow us on all of the social media that you find there, and you can make up some others if you like. Email me at dclay at HoustonPublic media.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd, typical Todd Holslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing digitized eyes. Thanks to George Lewis for being here. And thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>